All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome uh, to this uh, session uh, that we're having this morning on financial inclusion. My name is Matt Murray. I'm the editor in chief of The Wall Street Journal. It's a real honor to be here today to talk about this uh, very important topic with you. We should have a lively, informative discussion on an issue that I know is of great urgency to all of our panels here and our attendees in the audience. Uh, as a reminder, when we talk about financial inclusion, we're talking about access to and the use of quality, affordable financial products and services that lead to financial well-being around the world. This, of course, uh, is a major issue for many countries and many people around the world. There are some tantalizing data points, as we'll discuss this morning, that suggest inclusion has grown. There was a World Bank study last summer that revealed that 76% of adults now have a bank or mobile money account, which is up from 51% a decade ago. Those are very encouraging numbers, as we'll discuss. However, we should emphasize it still means that one in four adults are unbanked and that many of those uh, remain closer to the edge in assets and with limited ability to quickly access funds in the event of an unexpected cost or challenge. We're also meeting here, of course, at a time of inflation and volatility right now on the prices for basics such as food, energy, and housing. Now to discuss the issues, we have a very distinguished panel here on stage. Her Majesty Queen Maxima, Queen of the Netherlands, and the United Nations Secretary General Special Advocate for Inclusive Finance. You've been there since 2009 doing that role, so you have a long time commitment and uh, are an advocate for this issue in a long time. Dinesh Kumar uh, Kara is the Executive Chairman of the State Bank of India. Alfred Kelly Jr. is the uh, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Visa. Uh, and Shivani uh, Saroya is the Founder and Chief Executive Officer of Tala. Tala is a uh, global Android app that delivers financial uh, services around the world in uh, uh, markets that need access, Kenya, the Philippines, Mexico, and India particularly. And you've granted nearly uh, $4 billion in access to funds around the world. Is that right? So welcome. It's good to have all of you here for what I hope is going to be a very lively discussion. Uh, let me start with you, uh, Your Highness. Um, just give us a sense right now at this moment in the world of where we stand on the issue of financial inclusion, positive, negative. How do you see the situation after your long time involvement? Well, um, first of all, thank you very much for having us here. And I think that this issue of financial inclusion has been one of the headpieces in Davos. And, and I think it, it should actually continue to have uh, the attention it needs. Because, yes, we are at 76%. And I have to say I'm extremely proud because when I started this work, we're actually under 40%. And uh, we invested in data collection. We invested in, in you know, trying to get sort of, you know, regulators sort of in and also the private sector in. And that has actually resulted in uh, an incredible increase on in financial inclusion, in, certainly in the access side. Um, so 76%. And what I think is actually very important for the last three years is that it was actually white, that growth was widespread to many countries, whilst the survey before was actually mainly China and India doing the big growth. And now we're seeing a humongous amount of country, uh, countries actually growing. So um, very good. Yes, of course, we have 1.4 billion people that still do not have an account. And those are mostly rural. Those are mostly uh, women. <laughs> There's a big gender gap still, even though they're actually narrowed the last time, and also the poorest. So we really need to focus on these three groups, and we need to do intentional sort of focus on the women. We need to do intentional getting to people in the rural areas and the poorest. And for that, something that is extremely important, given that, you know, most of this growth has actually been through the digitization, I would say, like, you know, you, uh, Siroya, have actually sort of, uh, uh, you're a good, good uh, case from it. We need to have what we call the digital public goods. It's not true that everybody has a mobile phone and the mobile phone is actually of high quality and has a good connection, and certainly in the rural areas. We need to have connectivity of high quality. We need to have IDs, which are also digital, because without an ID, you cannot open a bank account. Mm -hmm. You need to have interoperability. You have a fantastic payment system in India by actually having interoperability in the payment system that's actually allowed much more use cases, you know, much you know, cheaper uh, services. So that's extremely important. We need to also have cybersecurity cyber measures mm -hmm. because that's what actually give you trust as well as, for example, digital financial literacy. So 
these th couple of things we need to actually start sort of, you know, having as a base of, you know, infrastructure and public goods for this to really rise in a in inclusive, affordable and really competitive way. Your Majesty, um, when you talk about the great progress that you've made <clears throat> for these last, this last 25 percent, you talk about all these access issues. Is this a tougher 25 percent because of the issues you just raised? Does it take extra effort? I, I don't mean to minimize what's The last what's mile begun. is always tougher, yeah. right? I mean, and, and then because you get into discussions, you go to countries and said, you know, the last mile connectivity, for example, is very, you know, difficult, you know. So most of the private sector companies, they, they do not want to sort of mobile companies, you know, go to a very low, dense populated area and give it the same type of, you know, service that you do it in the urban areas. It's difficult. Yeah. But that we have to really think, you know, private and public about, you know, how do we share antennas? How do we, we share sort of, you know, maybe a broadband uh, you know, situation? <coughs> uh, Bangladesh is actually trying to do it with broadband. So they're actually very good examples of doing that. But we have to really work together much more, much more between the private and the public sector. Mm -hmm. And it will, I, I think it will be harder in very undense populated areas. And I think the working together is going to become much more relevant and partnerships. Okay. Dinesh, that uh, is a good uh, segue to turn to India. And I want to ask, you've made great progress in India, partly because of mobile phones. So I wanted uh, to uh, get your sense of first how things are and particularly how did the pandemic and the kind of digitization uh, 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 leapfrogging that happened in the pandemic, how has that changed the situation uh, in India? Thank you very much for having me on this in this particular program. Well, of course, uh, the country has a population of 1.3 billion, and we have uh, mobile phone users, or uh, maybe the mobile phone connections. It is as high as about 1.2 billion. That is one of the major aspects. The second is, even when it comes to internet users, we have got about 800 million plus users who are using the internet. So these are some of the basic rails which really helped us in terms of ensuring that during the pandemic period when there was hardly any access to the cash, how to make the cash available to a very large segment of population. And actually with the help of uh, these connections, we opened about 480 million odd accounts. It was way back in the year 2015 and during the pandemic when it, uh, it all started, we ensured that in no time, the money should be made available to all these account holders. If we look at the total population of 1.3 billion, 480 million such account holders virtually means that there's at least one account in every household. Mm. So that is something which has helped us in ensuring that these people get the money. That is one part. Second is, during pandemic, we did a, another excellent job, which was essentially ensuring that everybody get the food grains. We used to have a lot of stock of the food grains. <clears throat> and because we had the UIDAI, which is the unique identification number, we ensured that as against distributing cash, much of cash, we should make available the food grains. And that has helped us in ensuring that not excess money supply should be there. And that is one of the reasons why when it comes to inflation scenario across the globe, mm -hmm. advanced economies have seen much higher inflation, whereas countries like us, we have seen much lower inflation. So that is the other aspect which has, which has really helped us. So what has happened is that one, of course, is uh, these accounts have got opened. Second, we have got the payment rails, which are very, very robust. If at all, I may give you some kind of a complexion in terms of the number of transactions which are happening with the help of uh, these uh, uh, UPI, it is actually phenomenal. And within a month, we'll be handling about a couple of million transactions mm -hmm. in no time. So it's a very robust, that is one part of it. In nanoseconds, the money gets transferred to the beneficiary's account. And when it comes to usage, we have not confined it only for the money transfer. We are actually ensuring that through these accounts, people should be in a position to buy their insurance, their life insurance, their personal accident insurance. So all this is something which has created a lot of buy-in for these accounts. And we are not only relying on, uh, only on the mobile phones, etc. 
we have created banking correspondence to ensure that the last mile connectivity which was rightly mentioned by by her majesty is a very major challenge i'll just give you one example we as a bank we have got more than 23000 branches in the country we have got 67000 banking correspondents we have got mobile uh, uh, micro atms which are being used for dispensing cash mm. though we are having qr codes we are trying to digitize the payment system to a large extent but still as it happens in any emerging market economy there is still the relevance of cash so i think we have made the 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 products or the channel very very vibrant by offering multiple products and we are not confining ourselves there itself we are also evaluating the index we have actually the, the reserve bank of india central bank has created a index financial inclusion index which actually measures the excess uses and the quality and when it comes to quality for a country like us we had lot to invest in terms of the the financial literacy and we are ensuring that we disseminate that information mm -hmm. and particularly when we are transferring such a large sum of money through the digital medium the cyber security becomes very important mm -hmm. and there what we have experienced is lack of financial literacy lack of digital literacy has led to situation where people share their credentials so we are leveraging that kind of education initiative also so that people should be in a position to be aware how should how should they use the digital channel mm. so these are some of the initiatives which we have taken and it has led to a situation i can i can perhaps share with you some number uh almost what 100 billion odd of leakages which used to happen between the subsidies which was originated and which finally got received at the beneficiary end that could be avoided mm -hmm. by virtue of this kind of a transfer which we could achieve the cyber uh, issue sounds very serious though the more people who have access the more widespread uh, uh the use of uh, digital financial services becomes the more they're targeted by people for theft and it sounds like that's a significant challenge sometimes to make sure people we uh, uh are, are adequately protecting themselves and not sharing their information yeah we keep on reaching out to them and it's uh, the way forward is only repeating the message mm -hmm. and amplifying the message multiple times and that is something which we keep on doing and that is that's how we are trying to get over this particular challenge mm -hmm. shivani uh india is one of the places where you are but you're in other places so step back a little bit what have you seen during uh the last 3 years in terms of the growth and uh, uh uh incorporation and if you could also could talk a little about how the economic volatility and ups and downs are affecting use of services right now sure uh and thank you again for having me as part of the panel um i think maybe i'll start also by saying you know when i think about what financial access truly means um i think of it as we're we're essentially creating an entryway into this financial ecosystem. And so at Tala our mission is around enabling financial agency for the global underserved. And so when we think about agency, yes it's about access, but ultimately it's about having choice and control over your full financial life. And so when I think about the work that we've done across our markets, what we started with was really thinking about infrastructure and data. Um because when we think about getting to that last mile, the major problem that we all face as financial institutions or operators focused on financial inclusion is really a lack of access to the insights and understanding of the underserved and so how do we even identify them how do we credit score them and then from there how do we serve them in multiple mechanisms so that we are a true part of their financial lives on a day-to-day -day basis And so we started by developing this Android application that's bringing in this mix of behavioral data and mobile data allowing us to create a new kind of credit score that is very much based on what is the day-to-day -day volatility of this underserved customer. And so uh that is one of the ways that we were able to navigate the pandemic and these other crises that may happen is is really being there on a day-to-day -day basis with them. From there we can also think about how do we customize these products. 
So again, entry into this ecosystem is one thing, but what we're all looking for is engagement to understand how does the customer then build uh, their credit over time? How does the customer pay their bills? Which bills do they pay? Um, how much do they save? What can we provide as incentives or benefits to then bring in more capital into the industry? And so we started with access to credit as our first value. Um, but during the pandemic, we really saw that we needed to move beyond that. So in some markets like India and Kenya, digital accounts already existed. Mm -hmm. But in markets like the Philippines and Mexico, what we saw was even though our customers were receiving remittances, they had no way to actually access that cash mm -hmm. because it was physically impossible for them to get to those locations. And so that is why in 2020, we moved beyond access to credit and started providing a full financial account. And so now we are really that full account for them where they can save with us, they can make payments with us. And then on top of that understanding that we now have on them, we can provide better levels of access to credit. Um, across the countries that you are operating in, obviously uh, big, large, uh, distinct places, uh, I would think one of the challenges is giving a sort of a standardized approach to services, but also learning enough in each area to think as to customize, to think what are the products and what are the ways the products are used locally. H how do you get your knowledge deep enough in each of the countries to tailor what you're providing to their needs? Uh, I would say that, you know, one of the major things we focused on is global infrastructure that is modular. Mm -hmm. um, so to your point, um, you know, purchasing power across every market is going to be very different. So, you know, a dollar in, in Mexico is different than a dollar in, in the Philippines, especially during times of inflation. And so what we've done is allowed ourselves to actually have the ability per market to have different localized credit models, different... Um, essentially different credit facilities that cater to those markets and different credit strategies or algorithms for that. Um, it also goes into understanding the culture of those markets. And so we've done that in qualitative ways where we have product teams and user researchers across every market, but we've also done it at a pure, I would say machine learning and AI um, aspect where we are gathering all of this information and then able to again build global and then also local. Um, and I would say that for me, financial agency uh, for the underserved is very much about, again, customization. Mm -hmm. We cannot create a blanket product. We can create global infrastructure, but it does truly need to be around uh, the market context. Al, you've been patiently there. I know uh, Visa's got the... Um Probably, uh, if not the most, certainly one of the very top, most extensive financial systems in the world, and you're, you're everywhere in, in the world, essentially. You've heard a little talk about infrastructure. Uh, uh, among other things, Visa's made a commitment uh, for a big investment in Africa. But can you just talk a little bit about the, the, the infrastructure needs and challenges that still remain uh, for that last mile and to really get financial services out to everybody in the world? Well, Matt, thank you for having us. Uh, I maybe pulled together a few themes. I think the first basic th thing that's required for financial inclusion is a combination of educating people and providing that initial access to some kind of basic transaction ac account. From there, I think there's some common global themes that other, the other panelists have uh, commented on that uh, are important. But ultimately the implementation of this becomes very local mm -hmm. and uh, and it's going to be different in different markets. One of the things that we have found in our business and we operate in every country and territory in the world except for the six countries the U.S. Uh, has sanctions against is that it, it is a very local business. Uh, uh, payments, money movement, financial services is based on traditions and differences in laws and differences in customs and Etc. And I think we have to make sure that across the board, we're trying to work at a local level to make these things actually come come to fruition. And that's a, a combination of uh, Your Majesty talked about broadband access as an example. Uh, by our numbers, 43% of people in the world have never been on the internet. I mean, think about it. Everybody here Google's multiple times a day, but almost you know more than one in four. P, uh, more than uh, less than 
six out of 10 people have ever been on the internet. And this is, this is a big problem just even in the United States. I mean, the recent infrastructure bill that was passed by Congress in the United States is putting $100 million towards uh, more broadband access. Because even in New York City, where there's 10 million people in the greater area of New York City, the estimate is 2 million of those 10 million don't have broadband internet access. So it, it isn't simply a problem in the rural farms in China or in parts of Malaysia. It's, it's also in the outskirts of some of the, the biggest uh, cities. So we're very focused on trying to uh, both grow the buyer and seller side of financial services. So making sure that we are educating and providing access to people as an on-ramp into financial services, and then growing the, the acceptance footprint for small businesses, which are critical to enable people to have places to actually uh, transact. And the reality is that all of what's happened during the pandemic has actually been helpful from the perspective of, of making people realize that the world is, is shrinking and that the, the e-commerce capability allows you to open up your businesses to broader than the, the borders that define your specific uh, country. And we at, at Visa have created a capability for being able to push payments to 7 billion endpoints around the world. We can push payments to 3.5 billion debit cards, 2 million bank accounts, and 1.5 million wallets ar around the world. And that that is part of our contribution to try to make sure that the infrastructure capability uh, and the, the infrastructure and the capabilities that enables are continuing to grow. Mm -hmm. Your Majesty, uh, you've been involved in the issue for a long time. <clears throat> um, getting people their first account is really only the starting point, right? The work isn't done when that happens. You've, we've talked a little bit about education, but 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 part of the ch ongoing challenge is uh, a further engagement and actually growing financial uh, power over time. So, and, and many people in the, that we're talking about in the populations are actually still living somewhat close to the edge financially. So after that first step, after that first account, what has to happen and how successful are we at keeping people engaged? Well, first of all, it's access, that is usage, yeah. and that is outcome, right? So if we would actually think it in these ways, you know, we've actually gone in a very, we've developed very much the access, and we still have, you know, somewhere to go, but, you know, we're, we're on it. On the usage side, you know, yes, we, we see, you know, two-thirds of these people having, you know, this access are using to receive wages or to receive payments. 40% actually use it to, you know, save on top of that, and, you know, and maybe to borrow. But it goes in stages, you know. You start with, you know, the account, you have to gain trust. So the first year they start receiving some small payments and they start doing sort of bigger payments. And then maybe they start sort of, you know, leaving some money in that account and that stored value. It's like, oh, maybe you can actually do this even more. So, and then maybe there's another product coming in. But it's not obvious. First of all, what we've actually realized is that interoperability has actually helped tremendously to increase usage. If you have systems that are not interoperable, the use cases are actually quite limited, and therefore the usage is very limited. That's number one. And then number two is going back to the point that actually been told before, which is it's also, that is when basically the, the private sector has a very big role to play, is to know the customers, know what the underlying needs are. For example, you know, when do I, when these people, these mothers have to pay the fees for the school? Yeah know which time of the year it is, because they're going to start saving for that time. Or when the harvest is going to happen, and not, you know, give you, for example, a loan that you have to pay every month or every week you have to pay the loan back when you basically have six months of, you know, between your sowing and your harvesting. So <coughs> trying to sort of cater the products to things that they really, really need is extremely important. You were talking about the pandemic. One of the things we actually realized when people are in distress, remittances, even internal remittances, are of great importance. So that's been the first usage of financial services, you know, the, use, the first use case. Mm. But we have to realize in the pandemic is that a lot of people were in distress, not just a group in a region, in a country. Everybody was in distress. And then you really realize the need for other types of products, you know, much more savings, much more insurance, you know, maybe with, uh, you know, health issues. And that was a very big demand, and, you know, and actually some of the private sector members actually did actually supply to that demand. So, again, it's interoperability, it's being able to actually be connected, and at the same time, it's the use cases and the product design that, you know, has to come from the private sector.
Matt, if I could just dimension the remittance point that Your Majesty made. 800 million people get remittances from outside their country to pay for food, pay for clothing, pay for education. We estimate the flow to be about $770 billion a year. So this is a very, very real and important uh, use case. And it's one of the ways that starts to create some element of the entry and the usage. And on that, um, one, uh, is there a trust issue sometimes for people using financial services because uh, of their personal circumstances and because of the power of data? D do you have to convince them sometimes that these services are safe and effective for them when they might have uh, challenging situations? You know, when you're talking about money, period, yeah. trust is a big factor, whether it's digital or, or, or cash. Yeah. One of the things that we believe has to happen with, with remittances is that we need to move them so that they're 100 percent digital from the point of uh, somebody initiating it to the, per of the person receiving it. That number was only 3 percent were totally digital five years ago, and it's only 13 percent now, meaning at the, the other 87 percent of the time, somebody's got to get cash into the cash either comes into somebody or cash is uh, given out at the back end of it. If we can make it all digital, a, it, 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 it'll be faster, it'll be more efficient, and it will help create the these access at the other end for the receiver. So. Mm -hmm. So, Ronnie, I want to follow up on something Her Majesty said, which is the private sector has to move this forward in terms of innovation, in terms of products. So you may not be there now, but as you think ahead to how products like yours should evolve, will evolve, what, uh, what, what, are, the po what are the needs and what are the possibilities out there? And, and one piece I wonder about is, do you stay financial services forever or does eventually it become an everything app in a certain sense? But how, are you, how do you think about that? So I think uh, in, I would say two things. The first thing is when I think about even this point we're making around remittances, right? I think um, it, it is really critical that interoperability is part of that. So as I think about this kind of global infrastructure layer again, even companies like ourselves, we've integrated into cash rails like 7-Elevens, into remittance channels, into bill payment centers, uh, but also into mobile wallets, into traditional bank accounts, into places where people can physically pick up cash. And what we've evolved to is now also having our own digital account. Mm. But when we think about the underserved, Right? The reason that they focused on cash was trust. And it was this idea that I physically can hold this money. No one can take it away from me. I can put it under a mattress and I can keep it safe. And so when we think about how do we overcome that barrier of trust, one, interoperability starts there because we're just everywhere that they are already. So they see us, they can physically pick up the cash. But that next piece, I think, is value. And so the reason that we started with credit as our first product was because the underserved customer has very, very low levels of liquidity. 80% of the 8 million customers that we've already served are below minimum wage. These are truly the unbanked or underbanked customer. And so offering them an account and saying, save with us, bring your money into us, without giving them real value is a hard sell. And so by actually taking that first risk and saying, we will actually lend to you before you give anything to us, all you need to do is sign up with us, that changes, again, the paradigm. Mm. Now this customer realizes by bringing my money in, I get better access within this ecosystem. I, want, I have a technology question. This is going to sound like a very wonky Davos question. Is blockchain in the long run a help for something like what you do, potentially, or no help at all? So I believe that it can be very helpful as you think about scalability on the infrastructure side. And the idea of protecting people's capital, and again, money movement becoming much cheaper, faster. You know, Today, when a customer downloads our app, they get access to credit in under 10 minutes. So it's very instant. But when I, I get excited about this idea of, can we make it even faster? Um, and can we make it cheaper for for Tala as well as the customer. So I think it's useful there. In terms of consumer adoption, I think there is still a very large gap that we have to cover in terms of, again, the trust. We are just onboarding these billions of customers now into the digital realm. To then show them the fluctuation that could happen around cryptocurrency, I think is too much. And so I think that's where, again, we become the stewards and the true financial partner. 
Um, I would like to make a comment on that, and I think that, you know, we've actually done a lot of work on uh, central bank digital currencies, and I know that there's something that, <clears throat> certainly for all the people that I, uh, I talk to, there's a lot of interest in. Uh, basically, if we look into it, I mean, uh, a lot of people say it's good for financial inclusion. It's still to be seen. It's depending on the de design, the price, the trust, uh, the costs. Uh, talk about sort of, you know, the amount of electricity we have to generate mm -hmm. to actually make a blockchain currency actually work and the capacity of electricity in a given country. So, um, whilst, and, and it's still today, a mobile app is seven times cheaper, <laughs> you know, probably than, than a digital currency. So, um, the jury's still out there, design has to be really very good. Tadesh, I want to ask about one other aspect. We've talked here very much about uh, through the lens of individuals, of course. We haven't talked in, uh, much about businesses and financial uh, inclusion. And obviously, India is one of the most dynamic entrepreneurial countries in the world. So can, can you share a bit uh, of, of, of how your efforts have affected businesses and startups and the opportunities for them in India and what, you, what, what you've done, what needs to be done? Sure. Uh, when we opened these accounts, they were all zero balance accounts. And now, over the period of time, it has come to a situation where almost about $50 is an average balance in these accounts. So this also means that we're in a position to channelize the small savings from across the country from such a large population of the country. It is almost one third of the country's population. That is one aspect of it. The second aspect is when it comes to, we have also started extend, extending them loan facilities against whatever balance they are keeping in their accounts now. Based upon that, we have started extending them the loan facility, which helps them in scaling up their entity, whatever activity they are doing. So many of them are doing small little businesses, but that also gives us, this initial loan facility gives us an, enough uh, visibility in terms of the nature and the kind of transactions which they are doing. We have come to a stage we have started running analytics on these accounts. And we have started offering them the pre-approved business loans as well, those who are coming to those levels. So I think it is, in a way, it has become a, one of the very important building pillar for the economy now. Because it was never envisaged mm. that these are the set of people who can become so relevant for the Indian economy. But today, they are one of the important components of the, of the Indian economy. Mm. And also, I think when it comes to inclusivity, this is going to go a long way. And when we have started using the banking correspondents, they are helping us in identifying the potential awareness opportunities in these, with this group of people. Mm. They are nearer to the ground. They are nearer to their commercial activity. They have got much better commercial intelligence about their actions. So all this is something which is uh, unstructured information, but it is being put to use to ensure that we build up a good quality awareness out of it. Matt, if I could pull together a couple of these last points. Um, small businesses are critically important. Yeah. They're 40% of the GDP of many countries. They're 45% they're of the GDP in the United States. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're the engine of growth for jobs and uh, the economies of the, around the world. But where we need to help them is with low-tech solutions. It's not blockchain. Mm. Uh, India is a great example. There's a Bharat QR code. You don't need electricity. You don't need telecom. You put a QR code up, and that immediately opens up acceptance of the world, or, or at least in the face-to-face -face world, for that merchant. Very low key. I mean, the QR code could be on a piece of cardboard. The other thing that's happening, and I'm on my phone with me, is we're turning phones into point-of-sale devices mm -hmm. so that... Again, you don't need electricity, you don't need wires. You're, you're a merchant and you have a phone. Somebody can come and buy by literally tapping their phone to your phone. And so these are like real, we have, we have to be thinking about smart, pragmatic, even lower tech solutions yeah. to try to uplift these small businesses and get them into the financial mon mainstream. I think that there's also a very important point on the SMEs. First of all, as you said, you know, the economic impact of it. And is there also agents for financial inclusion as well? Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have acceptability of digital wallets, the people are going to continue in cash. 
True. So we need to have a very widespread digitization of merchants all over the country. The other very big issue is we have the cash that is still continuing to be there. And that we have to think, why is that cash still there? There's trust, there's, you know, that you have to sort of build it. But there's also another issue, which is taxation. And there is a very important point in when merchants say, you know, why should I actually tell all the transactions that I'm doing? Because I'm going to become formal. And we're talking about, you know, 80% informal merchants, informal SMEs. I mean, there's very little amount of actually formalized. Mm -hmm. So we need to also have a vision, and that's where I think it would be wonderful if the Minister of Finance and General Developing Walu, and actually the IMF has actually written a paper on this, on how important it is to make it extremely simple to become formalized with very low levels of taxation for them to really grow, and then they will grow their own productivity because with these low tech things, they also all of a sudden they have sort of, you know, inventory management, they can actually increase their markets because they can actually sell into, into other markets that they cannot access, you know, by foot anymore. They can actually sort of, you know, get much better information about prices. So this, it would actually become an amazing productivity hike for a lot of these merchants and SMEs. But there's, a, but there's a trust issue there is really what you're saying, which is once my data is available, once I'm using it, once, particularly if I'm in a public-private uh, situation, there's a transparency there. And of course, in many parts of the world, for many small businesses, the economy is... And, and it changes, economy, really, and it right? changes per country, I have yeah. to say. In Mexico, this is a very big problem. In Argentina, it's a very big problem. Uh, but in other countries, you know, in, in some African countries, that is not an issue. Mm. So it also varies ac according to region and countries. But this is something that we really have to address. So what is the good to actually formalize, yeah. uh, you know, systems in general and start to, you know, and, and actually expect very little very beginning or just try to sort of, you know, completely, you know, kill them with forms and, mm. and, and, and red tape and, and, you know, very high taxation. And they're always going to try to avoid that. And you will never have the capacity to supervise that. I, I can see you wanted, you wanted to jump in because it, it, this trust issue and this sort of uh, codification issue has to happen, but it's part of the challenge and part of the educational job as well, I would think. And I think it's actually on us as operators and financial partners to think again long term. Mm. So for us, if we really believe in financial agency for the underserved, then competition is good. Right? We actually need more people trying to serve this population. Who's your competition in these places? Who do you, who do you, who do you look to uh, at other apps or products? Who, I mean, are there, other, so, yeah, are, are there I, a lot of people in your space you're looking against? I mean, I think that we see that traditional banks are trying to come downstream. Mm. It's hard still for them to take the kind of risk that we do or move as nimbly as we mm. do. Uh, we see the super apps trying to get into financial services. But again, what we see is most have actually stayed, again, at that you know, middle class to upper middle class population where they're offering higher quality products and higher choice of products. But again, that entry and access, the fundamental like, are we really focusing on the unbanked and the shocks that they're facing? Not many people are playing there. Yeah. But I think that's why it's on us as companies where, yes, we've served now, you know, 4 billion in access to credit to almost, you know, these 8 million customers. But it's what have we also gained as a result of that? We've gained access to their families, to their networks, to their communities. And so how do we help other service providers leverage the infrastructure that we've built and the understanding of this customer base? And so for me, I think that's how we move further in financial access is not do it by ourselves, but really think about, again, these collaborations and partnerships, even as operators or, again, with governments. And governments play a very vital role. Uh, if governments adapt to having their subsidy programs done digitally, it'll make a big difference. Yeah. To the point about access, in Uruguay, they're incenting uh, merchants to get POS devices. In Italy, you get tax rebates if you're a merchant and you uh, 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 di digitize your, your payments. And so it, these, in, these incentives and these actions by governments also play a big role. And I think it's all a very important point uh, you're all making, which is uh, the digital uh, revolution is one of the greatest opportunities to reach the unbanked ever if you take the action. But uh, in many cases, it's still the default to go to the middle and upper class and, and forget about that population. Um, I want to see if there's questions in the room that we want to take. I think there's probably not enough time, but uh, this one right here. Thank you for the comments. My name's Claire Tilke. I live in China. 
and uh, lead Heinz, one of the largest international real estate firms there. Um, you know, the question is for all countries. We One of our focus is on affordable housing um, and access, but it, in the last mile discussion that came up earlier and then particularly addressing women, you know, what do you feel are actionable items that the private sector can take uh, for those of us who are not in the digital side but do have some access to this population? Yeah, I can, and I, I'm, I'm sure that you can also do, uh, because you've actually sort of had a going with clients. Number one, have an ID. Women have much less IDs than men, so therefore they cannot open a bank account. Uh, they have not only are less connected, their phones are actually less good than their sons and their husbands. And if they do not actually have to share the telephone with sons and husbands. So this, on the gender side, these are two very important issues. And then afterwards, it's thinking about the product. It's really going to very, you know, safe and really thinking about the needs of these women, you know, the health needs, the education needs for, for the household, the energy needs. Um, I think that there's so much, you talk about affordable housing. I mean, this help, this, there are a lot of fintechs now that are actually starting to think about so this brick safe or, you know, how do you little by little start saving instead of actually, because what people used to do before women, they got some money. They put some bricks, they put on the side. The next time they have money, they put on the side. And they start sort of, you know, until they can actually build up a whole room. But, you know, comes a rain, half of the bricks actually get destroyed. So you, you, there's other ways we can actually help them do the same thing instead of actually having the physical bricks, but having sort of digital bricks and actually being able to save in that way. So um, it's really listening to the underlying needs. And I think you can actually fill that in and maybe or things that you've actually done in which women can actually use more of your, your products. I would, I would just provide an example from our work. So uh, we've served now over 1.5 million women small business owners across these markets. And I think it is really critical to understand their needs. But I think, you know, again, I, I go back to trust and value. And I think it's when you can prove that this is a product that will protect your privacy, that nobody else needs to know. So to your point on, you know, this is safe if you save with us, your husband or other family members cannot access this. You know, in, in many countries around the world, savings is actually, you know, considered selfish because you're not spreading the wealth among your family. You know, and so we have to find ways to, again, start with that trust, that privacy, and then from there, again, provide the incentives and the value so that the woman actually then comes in and continues to build her financial life with you. Maybe we just one more thing to add. I mean. I've actually spoken to women and said, I go to this correspondent banking because there's a woman there. If there's a man there, they will not go there because they will not share it with, because she might tell, he might tell her husband. Or, so I think also having that example that, you know, that, that would actually sort of increase the trust is extremely important. I want to try to another one. We've got a question right here. No. How can you ensure these applications are safe by design? Um, I'm an Australian regulator and we see technology facilitated abuse, financial abuse as a form of course of control over women. Um, we even see um, men sending child support payments to their former partners and using microaggressions in the, the um, FPOST transactions. Um, so how do you ensure that these are safe by design and they aren't misused by, by people who may want to have financial control over their partners. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I may come in here, because normally when it comes to all these various correspondents, we allow them access to uh, a, an intermediary core uh, functionality. And when we offer them the access, we also ensure that there should be adequate firewalls, which they must uh, be observing always and we can have an oversight on what kind of firewalls are there. And that is something which is helping us in ensuring, because what you mentioned is very important, because unless and until there's a credibility of these uh, intermediaries, the, the confidence level of the larger population will always be a, a matter of question. So I think it is very incumbent on the part of intermediaries and also the institutions who are involved that they have to create an, uh, an ecosystem which is absolutely secure. It is not merely that. It is not merely the, the digital ecosystem, but also there is a need for having an adequate oversight 
on the functioning of these correspondents also so that they should not uh, somehow get into an activity which can shake up the trust of these larger populations mm -hmm. which means they, they must not embezzle the money whichever whatever they are accepting so that's why we invariably use the digital and the physical mechanisms to have adequate control on all these intermediaries no, maybe. I mean, we've been doing issues on consumer protection now for so many years and having recourse mechanisms. If somebody really loses the money, you know, the, the company has to be able to actually give that money back if there was a fraud. I mean, and it has to be something that has to be very fast because otherwise the loss of, you know, of trust is, is incredible and it goes very, very quickly. So, I mean, the companies, and that has to be something that has to be worked between the private and the public sector in terms of, you know, in case of all these risks, what are the recourse mechanisms? And, you know, how fast are you going to be? Do you have a, you know, 24-hour, you know, telephone number somebody can call and immediately sort of, you know, so those are the things that are actually going to increase trust. I mean, I don't know about the husband sending sort of messages. I mean, something that, you know, depending on per culture, these things are going to be sort of uh, dealt upon. But that's something, you know, you can definitely, between the public and private sector, can actually deal with. Your Majesty, appropriately with the last word. Thanks very much. Obviously a topic that there's a lot of passion about. That's an important issue in the world. Four panelists who know a lot and are very committed to uh, working on financial inclusion in many ways. So many thanks to all of you for your time and thanks to all of you for being with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.